Okay. Who's been teaching at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Ljubljana for the last 20 years. Um, his books include with Zizek, um, Opera Second Death, and a, his own, A Voice and Nothing More. Somewhere uh, in a text titled Nothing Has Changed, Maladin notes that James Joyce is the addition, a certain N plus one. He also notes that Samuel Beckett is a subtraction, a certain N minus one. If one adds meaning, the other adds sense by subtracting meaning. When meaning runs ahead of sense, things don't make sense. When sense runs ahead, we lose meaning. Some encountering Maladin is the feeling through thought, somewhere meaning and sense coincide. It's in the gesture of the slippery that his voice seems to me to give voice on avarice and maybe mercy, Maladin Dollar. Well, thank you so much. Is this all right, Sunrise? Yes. Um, thank you, Nida, for this introduction. Thank you, Yana Prava University, for inviting us all and uh, organizing this, uh, this conference. And thank you in particular, Rohit and Aaron, for being the driving force and um, doing, doing all the work, the, the conceptual work which was necessary to bring this about. Um, all right, I guess we just uh, start. Um, the title of my paper is Avatars of Avarice, and I will speak actually about the sin of avarice, all the sin of humanity, but which had precisely so many avatars through history, and we are living through ever new avatars of this avarice. And I will start with three mottos. And the first motto is from Freud. In the psych psychology of everyday life, Freud gives an example of a slip of a tongue made by a young lady. She was talking about her family, and she said in German, Die haben alle Geiz? Ah, ich wollte sagen Geist. Which literally means, they are all so full of avarice. No, sorry, I wanted to say full of spirit. Huh? She, made, she made a slip. So the lady wanted to praise her family, but against her will, through the tiny slip, she expressed what she really thought of them, against her will. Their pretense of spirit was but a cover for the miserly impetus. Behind the facade of spirit, there is the dirty secret of avarice. And the unconscious always uses the natural terrain of language, the homonymies, the similarities, resonances, echoes. So in German, there is but a tiny difference between Geiz and Geist, between avarice and spirit. So this tiny slip bridges over a huge distance between two entities that seem to have nothing in common. Spirit strives for the non-material, the elevated, beyond the worldly concerns, purification, generosity, ideas, ideals, transcendence. Avarice, on the other hand, stands for tight-fistedness, for pettiness, selfishness, keeping for oneself the dirty little passion, holding on to the material, the usury, striving for profit, accumulation for the sake of accumulation. So is there a link? I think this slip can be taken as an allegory. There is nothing that semantically connects spirit and avarice. Yet once we have heard this slip, we cannot quite brush it away. It is as if avarice itself can be seen as a slip of the spirit, its stain, its dirty secret, its concealed mover. The history of avarice is like the other, the flip side of the history of spirit. Its mirror in which it cannot recognize itself. For it displays a dirty facet of desire in which there is something unforgivable. Yet this dark other half is hiddenly inscribed in it. It not only subtends the advent and rise of capitalism in its modern social structures, but is also inscribed in the forms which inform our spiritual world. There is a whole project that can take its starting point in this Freudian slip. To write the history, and particularly of the modern times, of the intertwined nature of the one and the other, the spirit and avarice. And since the greatest book on spirit ever written is Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, Phenomenologie des Geistes, its counterpart, its other half, its complementary volume, 
could be conveniently called phenomenology that guides us, phenomenology of avarice. So we tried to make a sketch of such, of such a project. The Freudian slip, which is louder. Ah, make it closer? OK. Shout. So it's OK. Um, this Freudian slip, which is like a pun, displays a beautiful economy. There is the maximum opposition of meaning, whose counterpart is the maximum closeness of sound. It expresses the greatest distance by the least distance, Geist and Geist. The two words begin the same way and produce the crucial minimal difference only at the end. And one has to actually listen carefully, not to mix them up. And this recalls for our theory of jokes. Like, why are jokes funny? Why do we laugh? And his answer in the book on jokes is Ersparnis am psychischen Aufwand, which is saving psychical expenditure. The joke brings together the most disparate domains by the minimal means, and thereby it saves a lot of energy. There's like a short circuit between two distant realms of thought, and the saved energy produces laughter. By the short circuit, the joke manages to lift the repression for a moment. It fools the repression with the help of homonymy, and brings the repressed content to light. The more distant the two entities, the more minimal the means, the more energy is saved. So there is something parsimonious in jokes. They are thrifty. They save energy. But also something completely anti-thrifty. For they save energy with no discipline, no work, no sacrifice, no renunciation, which is the turmoil of the miser. They do so instantaneously, by sheer serendipity. What the miser achieves by hard work, the joke seems to do with no effort at all, by a happy find. And the saved energy is not stocked and accumulated, it is immediately used up and dissipated in laughter. Maximum saving is freely thrown away. So there is like an immediate coincidence of avarice and dissipation, thrift and waste. And this is an intriguing topic, avarice and jokes. And I don't mean jokes about Scotsmen, but one should perhaps nevertheless keep in mind that Adam Smith was a Scotsman. So there is something of a Scottish joke in the modern political economy. A young lady um, didn't invent this Geist Geitz connection. It was available in German language for a long time. It was sporadic sporadically evoked. Thus, by Marx, and this is my second motto. The second motto, which doesn't quite stem from Marx himself, but from Pliny, Pliny the Elder, Plinius Meyer, the Roman writer from the first century of our era, quoted by Marx. So this is from the Critique of Political Economy, the 1859 text. He, co he quotes Pliny. Um, OK, I skip the Latin. From money stems the first origin of avarice. In Geld liegt der Ursprung des Geizes. From money, this is Pliny, the first century. By rapid stages, what was no longer avarice, but a positive hunger for gold, flared up with a sort of frenzy. And Pliny's Latin word is actually not frenzy, but rabies, rabies. This Pliny's wording, famous auri, is very probably a quote from um, Virgil's Aeneid, the famous quote, auri sacra fames, the accursed hunger for gold, the accursed greed famine for gold, the line that Marx also quotes on the same page. And this Latin genitive, famis auri, makes the phrase ambiguous. One can read it as hunger for gold or as gold's hunger. It can be an objective or a subjective genitive. Who is the subject of hunger? Hunger. What is its object? Is it we who lust for gold or is it gold's own hunger that is at stake? Does gold feed on us with an insatiable hunger rather than us seeking to satisfy our hunger by gold? our hunger beyond hunger. The context in which Marx brings up Pliny's quote is very telling and brings us to the gist of the matter. Marx argues against the common assumption that the quest, the hunger for gold and money, is in line with striving for material go goods. For Marx, the paradox is that avarice aims at that in money what is beyond any material goods, and money itself is an embodied paradox. 
its material body becomes, I quote, but a shadow. Marx speaks of the process of idealization, idealisierung, and of Geldseele, the soul of money, the money soul. The very existence of money entails the division into the material and the immaterial, body and soul. I quote, the miser clings to the treasure, while he doesn't allow the money to become the means of circulation. The greed for money acquires its money soul in its permanent tension with circulation. So the miser strives for the immaterial money soul. What in money is more than money, money beyond money, but ultimately all money is beyond money. This is what makes up its paradoxical nature. And this process of idealization thus entails both Geiz, avarice, and Geist, spirit, as its two offsprings. Geld, Geist, Geiz. It is as if money is at the same time at the origin of both spirit and avarice. Derrida commented on this, on this precise spot in uh, the, spectra, the spectres of Marx. And I'll come back to this. Now, my third motto is a completely different kind and brings us to present times. <clears throat> um, it's based on another German pun. It only works in German. Uh, it sort of makes a strange couple with the first motto. Namely, in 2003, the German company Saturn, dealing with electronic equipment, came up with the publicity slogan, Geiz ist geil. Uh, there is this resonance, you can see the pun in the words, which would mean avarice is sexy, avarice is cool, or avarice is even avarice is horny. So this was part of a large marketing campaign in all German-speaking countries. And the slogan shows a very different spirit of our times, the spirit remote from Freud's and Marxist times. No more avarice as the dirty secret behind a spiritual facade. This is rather the coming out of the miser. Avarice put forward as something presentable and viable, not something to be ashamed of or hidden. And this was uh, in line with the, well, greed is good slogan from the Reagan era. Sexy is the last thing one would imagine when thinking of, say, Molière's Arpagon or Shakespeare's Shylock or Dickens's Scrooge, the three proverbial misers whose iconic figures were provided by the greatest of authors, Shakespeare, Molière and Dickens. The misers are always terribly non-attractive, repulsive, hideous. The tight-fistedness is materially displayed on their ugly bodies. They always appear to be hors sex, beyond sex, outside of sex, the non-sex beings propelled by a drive which places them out of sex, a drive apparently stronger than sexual. For sex, after all, always involves expenditure, dissipation, waste. What misers want is pure accumulation. Not only nobody likes a miser, but nobody likes oneself as a miser. Being avaricious is not a source of narcissistic satisfaction. So this slogan tried to turn tables on the long tradition by saying that avarice, after all, is normal and actually attractive. Let's liberate people from guilt. There is nothing wrong with being a miser. Let's admit it. We all are at heart closet misers. And the slogan tried to socialize avarice. Misers of the world unite in Saturn. The classical figures of misers were always alone. This is a solitary sin. Misers don't socialize. It's each for its own. Everybody's an enemy. And the slogan had for a long time a great visibility and actually triggered a lot of public debate. There's a whole book on this. <clears throat> the Catholic Church came up with the counter slogan, Geiz is Gottlos, Avarice is Godless. But this was, an this, this was an expected reaction, which didn't quite hit the fame, nor could it counteract the first one. There was a far better, or philosophically minded, left-wing response. Geist is geiler, like, you know, avarice is sexy, but spirit is sexier. Spirit is sexier. <laughs> On the tracks of this Freud spun. Yet, and this is very telling, what turned the tables so that the slogan had actually backfired and got dropped was not a conservative or leftist outrage. It was the consciousness of enlightened consumerism, where the mere race for the lowest price and the biggest saving appeared to be at odds with the concerns about quality, ecology, third world working force, 
uh, fair trade, sustainable development, etc. So the promoters of the slogan were put on defensive and the company decided to abandon it in 2007. And the cynical result of this campaign, the lesson to be learned from this eventual failure, is not that people realize that avarice was bad, but that one can actually make more profit with the humanitarian, enlightened consumer than with the miser. The direct appeal to avarice is no longer so good for accumulation. But then, this was just before the crisis in 2008, and the crisis turned things upside down again with the newly discovered virtue of what? Of austerity. Austerity from Latin austerus, how very different word in appearance from avarice. It bears the connotation of severe, serious, strict, grave, rigorous, virtuous. This is not giving in to avarice and greed, to this miserly self-interest. This is not admitting to one's own dirty, avaricious impulses, as we Saturn. This is the imposed and inculcated avarice the socially prescribed and sanctioned avarice, the compulsory avarice, avarice cut off from one's own accumulation and stockpiling, the very opposite of it, the avarice on behalf of the accumulation of the others, masquerading as virtue. We should all responsibly restrain ourselves for the accumulation to continue. So in retrospect, even Saturn's Geizist guile seems more innocent or even endearing. Okay, let me come to the first part now, which is um, which deals with some general structure of um, avarice. Avarice is one of the seven deadly or capital sins, which are gluttony, pride, sloth, greed, anger, lust, and envy. It featured on all lists of deadly sins since its first proposal by Evagrius Ponticus in the 4th century, its standardization by Gregory the Great in 590, and then throughout the Middle Ages. Again, you have a very good book on, by Delumont on the history of the, this imagery of the seven sins. There is an opulent iconography that went along with them and graphically demonstrated them. And just to mention the best known iconic instances by Hieronymus Bosch and Peter Bruegel the Elder. And they stretch down to Otto Dix, the German expressionist, on whose 1933 depiction of deadly sins one can find Hitler. <clears throat> so, sin is an excess. It is a desire which goes too far, a desire run amok, a desire which perpetuates itself as a self-propelling, insatiable, insatiably feeding on itself. Sins are not crimes. They are not related to violation and direct commands or prohibitions. They are not infringement of the Ten Commandments. There is no command to tell us not to eat too much, but gluttony is a mortal sin. It is an insatiable hunger which feeds on itself. The more it is satisfied, the more it wants. But also the more satisfaction it derives from the very process of infinite dissatisfaction. There is like a perverse side satisfaction which is a byproduct of the interminable insatiability pertaining to the nature of desire. What is condemnable in sin is the excess which is driven by the internal logic of desire itself and which has gone beyond the limit. But the limit of what? The limit was always hard to establish since it's in the nature of desire to be driven beyond the limit. And there is a paradox. If the limit is set as a measure constituted by nature, by the yardstick of the natural satisfaction of needs which shouldn't be exceeded, then we would thereby lose desire itself, which is precisely what exceeds the need and what constitutes the specifically human. We would thus be led to the conclusion that the animal is the norm for human behavior. Excess lies in the very nature of desire. Hence, the very existence of desire is in itself already an incipient sin a sin in the making, a closet sin. Sins are thus also a contravention against the Aristotelian morality of the middle and moderation. Strangely, they are closer to the Kantian morality of the categorical imperative, for desire seems to be possessed by an imperative pursuing its goal regardless of all other considerations. And hence, Lacan's adage that the categorical imperative is desire in its pure form. 
There is something Kantian in sins. They pursue desire beyond the pleasure principle. There is again a paradox. First giving way to pleasure, but then pursuing it beyond a certain limit turns the very pathology into a sort of quasi-ethical principle, that is, to an inversion of ethics. If there is a pleasure principle that animates sin, then sinning tends to turn the pursuit of pleasure beyond the pleasure principle. And no sin demonstrates this more clearly than avarice. It seems to be the ethical sin par excellence. It is not a sin one covets. One could imagine finding some empathy with laziness, gluttony, lust. But there is hardly any sympathy for avarice, which tends to inspire repulsion and loathing. It seems cowardly, mean, paltry, conformist, although it takes enormous effort and very strong character. It seems to be the most uninviting and the dullest of all sins. It doesn't arouse imagination. Yet, perhaps for this very reason, it may imply some non-glamorous but interesting lessons and consequences. Sin is fascinating when it is inhabited by some diabolical, demonic dimension, a transgression that steps beyond the boundaries of law. And so, one may well condemn it, but it presents at the same time a specter of liberation and rebellion, a protest against the existing order, against the renunciations and hardships it imposes on us. So the sinners and the criminals also have the aura of romantic heroes, those who can free themselves from the restraints of the ruling morality and legality, even though they have to pay a price for it, which makes them even more heroic. Villains can figure as our secret coveted heroes. Sin, but avarice, well, avarice uh, lacks romanticism in imagination. It is just repulsive. Sin is usually seen as transgression. One perpetrates it because one is swayed by desire to breach the moral prescriptions. So this is one commonly held view of desire. Desire is rebellious, transgressive, promiscuous, chaotic, excessive, striving for enjoyment by disregarding social bans. But there is another side, the tyrannical one, despotic, ascetical, mean and enslaving. What does one give way to here? Not the enjoyment in an unusual sense, but to what? Asceticism, renunciation, something in desire that is stronger than any earthly satisfaction and bodily pleasures, and provides a more powerful lure. It seems that this tyrannical side of desire cancels all others. It reduces their apparent diversity to just one thing, the accumulation structured around the ever-missing object, the object impossible to have. Avarice is a sin which seems the very opposite of a sin. It demands harsh discipline, a lifelong self-discipline, renunciation, and the most oppressive control. A quote from Marx, Miser is the mart martyr of the exchange value. I like this formula, the martyr of the exchange value. So uh, this is also where avarice proper differs from greed under which it is commonly subsumed. Greed can seek possession and accumulation of a variety of goods. It can try to have them all, while avarice reduces all goods to one alone. Greed is compatible with consumption when greedily amasses goods in view of possibly consuming them, while avarice seemingly excludes consumption. Or to put it in a brief formula, greed is bulimic, avarice is anorexic. Avarice brings greed to its developed form, the minimal anorexic form. Yet, this second image of desire, displaying the, this utterly hideous face, is rather the moment which presents a certain truth of the first one, the transgressive and rebellious one. And one could coin a motto, well, for psychoanalysis more generally, depravity is misleading. So one could say, for psychoanalysis, there is more truth to be explored on the side of avarice than on that of debauchery and the romantic sinner, a truth about desire which is harder to swallow and more difficult to tackle. The strange thing with avarice as a sin is that it has all the traits of an overzealous virtue. The first precepts of morality are always renounce, renounce pleasure, discipline yourself, restrain yourself, economize, save, don't dissipate, modesty, abstinence. Those guidelines 
are most enthusiastically espoused by avarice. The miser appears to be the model of moral conduct, an emblematic figure of asceticism and renunciation, the quintessence of virtue. He's willing to give up everything except for the singular object. So it's hard to sort of disentangle avarice and virtue. It's good to be frugal, prudent, parsimonious, but it's bad to be avaricious, mildly, stingy, tight-fisted. Where is the limit? How to tell the one from the other? There is no good measure of economizing. The economizing deferral is the first step of morality. So virtue has the fatal tendency to turn into avarice, which is nothing but the internal excess of virtue, a virtue gone too far. It is clear that the absolute object of avaricious desire is not an object to be consumed and enjoyed. It is utterly useless. It has no use value. The miser doesn't save in order to enjoy the fruits of his saving later. He saves in order to save more. The object only serves to augment the treasure. But the greater the treasure, the more it becomes apparent that the object eludes. So the object that his desire aims at is a surplus object always lacking, never able to fill in the hole, of the, in, the, the, the hole uh, in the treasure. All treasure has a lack in its center. The ecstasy of counting and the amassed treasure is at the same time the agony of the lack. Not only the object has no use value, it has no exchange value either, and hence this martyrdom of the exchange value that Marx speaks about. What, it could be, what could it be exchanged for, since no other good could possibly have the comparable value? The surplus object can only have the surplus value, not something to be used and not something that is, has a counterpart in an equivalent exchange. The nature of Mises' desire is not hysterical. It doesn't flee from one object to another, always experiencing that this is not it. The miser doesn't have the problem of not knowing what he wants. He is not a being of doubt, oscillation, or procrastination. He displays the reverse side of the hysterical desire, of the fleeting desire constantly passing from object to object. Its reverse side is despotic, the side of absolute fixation, just one thing, and that absolutely. The miser knows what he wants. He has found his object, the ultimate secret of all objects, the equivalent of all objects of desire. And here, money well, is, in Marx, the general equivalent to which all commodities are translatable. The general equivalent of all objects of desire in avarice may well be incorporated in money as well, in coins, in gold, etc., but it obviously doesn't coincide with it. It is what in money is more than money, the excess over money, what money can't buy, lacking in any wealth, no matter how big, and thus has no equivalent the general equivalent without an equivalent. All objects may be translated into it, but it is not translatable into any object. It is just a surplus feeding on itself. Now, let me make a slightly abrupt uh, shift and quote some Lacan. Lacan is actually making this point, a point in this direction. And curiously, he, this is from uh, Desire and its interpretation, he invokes Simone Weil on the way. <clears throat> it's a quote from Lacan. The object of fantasy, the image and the bathos, is the other which takes the place of what the subject has been deprived of on the level of the symbolic, of the symbolic of the phallus. Thus, the imaginary object finds itself in the position of condensing in itself all traits or dimensions of being. That is, it becomes that formidable lure of being, l'heure de l'être, which retained Simone Weil when she pointed out the densest, the most opaque relation of man to the object of his desire, the relation of the miser to his casket. Here, the fetish character, which pertains to the object of human desire, comes to its pinnacle. But all objects of human world display this character by at least one of their aspects. So here we have it. Lacan himself, at a certain point, actually makes this move, that desire is translatable into this general equivalent, which is, which is the avaricious desire, the miserly desire, pinned to this um, casket, 
And this is the most opaque relation of a man to his object of desire. Okay. Um, the etymology of avarice tells us that avarice stems from Latin avaricia, which comes from aveo, avere, to want something very much, to want something very badly. And geiz, geizig, in German, comes from the Indo-European geit, which is again to strongly desire. So avarice is a desire brought to the extreme, an excess of desire. When in Slav languages, as my own, you have another etymological hint, like uh, skopuch, which is the Slovene word, but you have uh, analogous words in other Slav languages, comes from skopiti, skap, skep, the Indo-European, is to cut, to slash with a sharp instrument, which is basically to say, to castrate. What is skopuch? It's uh, actually, there's a word in Slovene, skopets, which can mean, it's seldom used, but this is a word which can mean both the miser and the eunuch. So, you have avarice and castration. So, language was not avaricious with indications here. The etymological link is not accidental. One can see in the rough formula that the, a miser is like a figure of self-castration. He's prepared to cut off all enjoyment which only appears as unnecessary expenditure and loss. He's prepared to mutilate himself in exchange for the absolute object, the absolute enjoyment, the treasure never to be had. Yet, at the same time, he's the figure of anti-castration, so to speak. Somebody um, stubbornly unwilling to accept castration. So let me give you this, this formula. Someone willing to castrate himself absolutely in order not to concede to castration. This would be the formula of uh, miser's desire. He's willing to lose everything in order not to incur, incur any loss. And this is the point that Lacan aims at with the question of uh, fetish. <clears throat> now Marx was aware of this, but with a different conceptual means. And here we get from this general structure of miserly desire to its historic avatars. I'll give you a couple of quotes from the Paris manuscripts, 1844 manuscripts. This is Marx. Political economy, the science of wealth, is therefore simultaneously the science of renunciation of want of saving. The science of marvelous industry is simultaneously the science of asceticism, and its true ideal is the ascetic but extortionate miser and the ascetic but productive slave. All passions and all activity must therefore be submerged in avarice. And here you have Marx, sort of uh, bringing all this uh, diversity of needs and diversity of production in capitalism to one, one only sort of core general equivalent in desire, as it were. There is the implication, which Marx draws a number of times, implicitly and explicitly, that a political economy and capitalism, as the system which it is embedded in, which it ventriloquizes, as it were, is actually a system of universalized avarice. And avarice could well be what forms, uh, to use this very latent word, under quotation marks, the libidinal economy of capitalism in its various facets. Its facets are multiple. So is the vast range of commodities and, uh, it produces. But the desire for these commodities, desire as opposed to need, is actually reducible to one root, to one common denominator, a general equivalent in terms of desire. All the categories that Marx discusses, and then we start with commodity, exchange value, money, capital, etc., constantly imply a certain structure of desire that subtends them. And here's another quote from the same manuscripts. Money, inasmuch as it possesses the property of being able to buy everything and appropriate or objects is the object most worth possessing. So, it's strange. The implication of this quote is that the desire for money is of a different stature than the manifold needs that commodities can satisfy. And commodity is, by definition, what satisfies a need. It is a pure potentiality, the capacity to have rather than actual possession or satisfaction of a need. 
Balzac, whom Marx admired so much, says in one of his stories, the story Gobseck, which is precisely a story about the ultimate miser, a story that actually Marx occasionally refers to. So in this story you have in Balzac is this adage, to be able to have is more than to have. So what has the potentiality to buy any object is more desirable than any object. And this entails a reversal. Any object, any commodity is then but the stand-in, a degradation of the real object. Anything one possesses is but a shadow of what one might possess. And hence money, having no use value, can be the embodiment of this potentiality, entailing a pure deferral and infinite accumulation. Hence, well, consumerism, which may seem to be the very opposite of avarice, is but its extension, its continuation and expansion. There has never been a less consumerist society than ours. Consumption always entailed expenditure and waste and loss. Whereas in the so-called consumer society, all consumption is completely framed by and subservient to accumulation. It is the form of appearance of its opposite, namely avarice. And, uh, well, as an aside, um, this is a quote from, this, actually, I don't know if you know, Georg Zimmel's book, The Philosophy of Money, but he actually at some point discusses precisely this. And they, I give just a single quote from Zimmel. Extravagance is more closely related to avarice than the opposition of these two phenomena would seem to indicate. So Zimmel was somehow quite aware of this. Avarice and consumerism, extravagance, expenditure, etc. are they're two forms of the same thing. I mean, they don't be fooled by this. And he gives a whole psychological types explanation of this. Of this. What? Um, Marx himself in the capital, and I don't have time to go into this, but it's interesting, he actually gives the outlines of a certain genealogy of what would later be called consumerism. Namely, he proceeds from the figure of uh, Schatzbildner, the tesaurator, the one who accumulates merely his treasure for himself, to finally the spendthrift as its inverted double, which is kind of miser with a vengeance. If there is a story that marks this historic turn, then it's Dickens's Christmas Carol, written in 1843. Everest seems like a pre-modern figure, and Scrooge, you know, the Dickens's proverbial miser, seems to be the last classical miser with all the pre-modern attributes. So where have all the misers gone since? And since they, they have become invisible, in the ambient world of consumer society. What happened in Christmas Carol is that the last grand miser converted to charity, thus marking the historic moment when avarice became so common and universalized that it became the air we breathe. The moment when the last miser abandoned his sinful miserly existence and became embodiment of charity is the moment when we are seriously screwed up. <clears throat> um, there's one last quote to illustrate this before I move to my, the, the last part of my paper. And this time, hmm, from Hayek. I never imagined I would quote Hayek in all my life, but here, here it is. Here I go. <laughs> Just one quote <laughs> from the road to serve them. Um, there is the erroneous belief that there are purely economic ends distinguished from the other ends in life. Yet, apart from the pathological case of the miser, there is no such thing. The ultimate ends of the activities of reasonable beings are never economic. Strictly speaking, there is no economic motive, but only economic factors conditioning our striving for other ends." End of quote. So see what I mean? Here we have it spelled out very clearly. There's a clear opposition between the pathology of avarice, confined to some isolated, bizarre cases, and the normal behavior of reasonable human beings striving for goods, commodities to satisfy their needs, but which are somehow inscribed in an economic framework as a collateral damage of this normality. But it follows from this quote 
the demiser is the only pure subject of economy. He follows, he pursues purely economical ends, as opposed to the rest of us who supposedly merely pursue satisfaction of our needs. In the maximum position, for Marx, structural avarice is the rule, even if it may seem opposed to the appearance. For Hayek, avarice is the exception which can totalize the rest of the economy. Okay. The seven deadly sins were traditionally opposed by seven virtues. The sin of avarice was opposed by the virtue of charity. Avaritia and caritas, avarice versus charity. And you had, again, numerous iconic depictions of the maximally opposed couple. If avarice is keeping for oneself, pursuing one's self-interest, accumulating the treasure for the sake of accumulation, then charity depends on mercy, of giving freely and generously without constraint and without expecting anything in return. Now, the one place in world literature where this opposition is magisterially staged, emblematically enacted at the dawn of modernity is Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. And where the whole play hinges on this opposition. Shylock, the proverbial miser and usurer, is confronted by Portia, the supposed embodiment of mercy. So how does mercy work? What is mercy? What is charity? And what is the logic that supposedly enables it to counteract avarice? What is the logic of charity that a century and a half later Scrooge converted to? Scrooge is a kind of Shylock who converted to Portia, a <laughs> century, 150 years later. So, <clears throat> Shylock, the, vin the villain of the play, appears in historical retrospective as the harbinger of modern times, the times to come, the model of financial capitalist, who is condemned in the play, but whose historical revenge will come when a financial capitalist will be praised as the very motor of development. Whereas Portia, with all her talk about mercy, appears as a pre-modern figure whose use by date is expiring. Shylock may lose in the play, lose his case in court, but he will take the historic victory. Portia may win in court, but her victory will be short-lived in the rapid and staggering rise of capitalism. The Merchant of Venice, written in uh, 1595-96, firmly goes through the motions of the pre-modern view. Yet, and this is always Shakespeare's genius, striking it with utmost ambiguity, which one could spell out like this. Christian mercy ultimately fares no better than Jewish avarice and usury. So they, and I would, I would say, I don't have time to go really into the analysis of this play, but I would say that they both seem to be placed on a Möbius strip. The one is passing into the other. This is really, if you, if you look at Shakespeare's setup, it does something completely different from what, what it proclaims to be doing. And actually, in a historic reversal, if this is a play about capitalism, mercy perhaps fares, fares much worse. What appears to be pre-modern in this play may well turn out to announce the postmodern ways of capital. The pre-modern joins hands with the postmodern. So let me now, in conclusion, address this charity and mercy, not as the virtue to counteract avarice, but as one of the capital sins on the par with it. Shylock, throughout the play, clings to the bond that gives him the right to extract the bond of flesh, the true equivalent of the surplus that the usurious accumulation was aiming at all along. To extract the bond of flesh aims not simply at the augmentation of the treasure, but at extracting the very stuff of enjoyment, the surplus enjoyment. And Shylock's purpose is to get to this, this surplus by the letter of the bond, by contract, by legal means. And there is the basic opposition. The bond binds, the contract obliges and strains, the letter exacts. This is how the usurer can get about his business and be covered by the letter of the law. Um, but mercy is what cannot be defined by any contract. It doesn't abide by law. It is the excess over the law. If it was the matter of a contractual bond, it would cease to be mercy. It is something that can only be freely granted. 
not demanded, not extorted. It can only be generously dispensed beyond any obligation. So this is how Porsche, when the case, case comes to court, and when it looks like the Shylock might win, abiding by the mere bond, this is how she defines mercy in one of the most famous speeches in all Shakespeare's work. I quote just at the beginning. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. Okay, so I have this double blessing. First for the receiver who is granted mercy without deserving it. Otherwise, this would not be mercy but the just recompense. And who can therefore only respond by, to this gratuitous gift by the boundless love. Boundless just as mercy is beyond measure. And it is a blessing for the giver who is amply rewarded not only by love and gratitude of the receivers, but also and above all by the image of his own generosity and worth, having done more than he was bound to do, and thus deserving the superior place from which he could bestow mercy on others below. We have a mini miniature theory of power in this speech. Power is composed of scepter and mercy. The scepter, I quote, shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to all and majesty, wherein does sit the dread and fear of kings. So this is scepter, inspiring all dread and fear. I quote, but mercy is above the scepter's sway. It is an attribute to God himself, an earthly power does then show like God's when mercy seasons justice. So, as opposed to the scepter and its coercion, mercy inspires love, free submission and devotion. Scepter stands for earthly power, displaying force and oppression. Mercy is the godly part of power. Power was bestowed on someone by the mercy of God, and he can only be true to this gift by himself displaying mercy beyond law and justice, thus proving that he is occupying the position of power deservedly, that he is worthy of the divine mercy that could put him in that place. The monarch could rule merely by law, by force and justice alone, but he proves to be worthy of his position if he freely grants the surplus over force and justice, over law and equivalence, without being in any way obliged to do so. And this is where mercy Seasoning justice provides the legitimacy of his status beyond legal legitimacy. There is law and love. So, I mean, to, to make it quick, and I won't, I won't go into this, Portia is a spontaneous Althusserian. Her divide corresponds exactly to the divide between the repressive and the ideological state apparatuses. And she's also a spontaneous Ag Agambenian. <clears throat> you know that Agamben saw the sovereignty precisely in this light. The sovereign is at the same time outside and inside the juridical order. Having the legal power to suspend the validity of the law, he is legally placed outside the law. Okay, so sovereignty is based on exception. The sovereign can suspend the law. And mercy is precisely the exception to the law. It is beyond the law, beyond the contract, beyond the reciprocal bond, as a surplus depending on the, well, caprice of the sovereign, who can freely grant it or, or not beyond any obligation. Or to put it again in a formula, mercy is the state of exception at its purest. The sovereign can suspend the law, expose the subjects to arbitrary violence, unmitigated by legal constraints, and he can bestow mercy beyond the rule of law granting exception to mere justice. The surplus that entails the response of love, love as a debt for a gift. Violence, authority, mercy and love would thus be different facets of the same entity. In this view, mercy is not merely the point of love beyond law, repression, contract, etc., but also coincides with or opens up pure violence without restraints, the state of exception. So, this would be then the indistinguishable mixture of violence and mercy. Why am I bringing this up? 
this question, the question of mercy. Loan and debt, aim at surplus. One lends to get back more than one gave. And the metaphorical force of Shylock's loan is that it presents the powerful image in enactment of the minimal mechanism implied in it. One ultimately always owes in flesh. The surplus is extracted from our flesh. It is based on the theft, the theft of enjoyment, the extortion of this surplus enjoyment. As opposed to this, there is mercy as the free gift for nothing, the gift not strained, in the opposition that massively subtends whole Shakespeare's piece, pitting against each other, avarice and charity, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the letter and the spirit, the retribution and clemency, the bounds of economy and the bounds of love. The economic bond aims at the extraction of surplus under the cover of the contract, while mercy is supposed to give without exchange, beyond any contract. But the crux of the matter is that mercy, under the cloak of its gen generosity, also hinges on the surplus and extortion. Justice is equivalence, the just punishment and reward according to what is deserved. And you know Hamlet's use every man after his desert, and who shall escape whipping? One always needs mercy, one is doomed by justice alone. So mercy is the surplus over the latter, over law and justice, not as square as taking, but as voluntary giving. But the gift in debts, all the more since its terms are not specified, and if they were to be specified, this would cease to be mercy. Hence, it opens an unspecified debt, a debt with no limits, an infinite debt. One is never worthy of mercy, and however much one gives in return as a response, it is never enough. It can never measure up to the free gift which has no equivalent, not in what one possesses. Mercy is the usurer, which by not demanding a circumscribed surplus, opens an absolute debt. It demands not an equal pound of flesh, but an equal pound of soul. The pound of flesh is the equivalent of profit and surplus value. The pound of soul is equivalent of the surplus value of submission and love. So there is the usury of love corresponding to economic usury. Now the Merchant of Venice stages a historical realization of this dispositive, which is emblematic for our culture, our economy, our social bonds. It displays the way that mercy starts to function precisely as a superego. The more we give, the more we are in debt, the more we are guilty, the more we are at the mercy of the other. Portia, the harbinger of mercy, conceals under sublime face the obscene part of the superego. She delivers her speech on mercy in disguise, cross-dressed as a man, and if there is deceit in her position of enunciation, there is worse. As, soon, as it soon turns out, the whole talk about mercy was but a rhetorical trick. Mercy doubly perverse. She could have started the trial by what she knew all along, naming that Shylock was an alien by Venetian law. He had no legal standing as a Jew, and the entire lawsuit was void from the outset. He was from the beginning at the mercy of the court, without realizing it. And all the talk about mercy that he should show was just but a ploy, since his, since his cause was lost in advance. He was, from the beginning, the homo sacer. The excess of avarice and usury embodied in the Jew corresponds precisely to the excess of mercy, its inverted double, embodied in this beautiful, wealthy, and super smart woman in man's clothes, parading with the insignia of power. It would seem that Shylock is the figurehead of capitalism, embodying its excessive nature, the accumulation, the accumulation, the profit, the extortion, the surplus, the price in flesh, the beginning of financial capital, the interest, the debt, the system of universalized avarice, and Portia would stand for the pre-modern figure of mercy which subtends, uh, subtended by sovereignty, the privilege of monarchs and deities to bestow mercy, and to thus show that they are not merely others of the law, but others of the other, the sovereign exception which can suspend the law, its merciful side disguising and coinciding with its cruel and obscene side. Now, why I'm bringing all this up for this final twist. 
Isn't it the production of this endlessly indebted man? Let's say Lazzarato's famous book on the indebted man expensively depicts. Isn't this rather the inversion, the historical victory of mercy, of infinite debt, of being at the mercy over Shylock's economy of debt and interest? Now, Simon Critchley and Tom McCarthy have argued in an influential paper on universal Shylockry. This is the title of the paper. And they argue, I quote, following Marx, <clears throat> the bourgeois world, the Antonian world of Christian capitalism, has become Shylockian. That is, Christendom has become dominated by Judentum, by what Marx calls practical Jewishness. Christians have become practical Jews. Capitalism is a system of universal Shylockry. When all Antonian limits of the oikos, the hearth, the home, the homeland, and the human have been burst apart by the energy of chromatistic exchange and excess. The giving of credit has shifted from a marginal practice allotted to Jews to the increasingly global manner in which identity is constituted. I owe, therefore I am. Being is being in debt. Goodness is good credit. End of quote. So, what, what I would like to argue for the end is that the excessive economy of Shylock may well appear in retrospect as a case of what Bataille has called a limited economy, restrained economy. And that Portia, the figure of mercy who comes to aid of Antonio and his Christian economy, may well be the figure of the future of the debt economy. Its turn, and this I use as a sort of slogan, beyond the Shylock principle beyond the Shylock principle. We've gone beyond the Shylock principle. It's unrestricted, unstrained, precisely, in nature, for the quality of mercy is not strained. Namely, according to the view of universal Shylockry, Shylock has ultimately taken the victory despite his defeat in the play with his universal judentum of capitalism and the harsh economic reality masked by, merciful, by the merciful Christian cloak. But aren't we rather faced with a universal portionism, where both the economic and the psychic superegoic reality of mercy has taken the upper hand, not as a deceptive disguise of the true judentum, but as a principle increasingly guiding economy. Now Lazzarato, in this uh, book on the indebted man, following Deleuze, evokes the infinity of debt emerging with Christianity and capitalism as opposed to the limited debt in archaic societies. But maybe what one has witnessed recently, particularly with this neoliberal turn in the last 30 years, with the new gear of this triumphant uh, neoliberalism, could be described as the infinitization of the infinite debt, a new degree of infinity. I said that avarice and mercy could be placed on the Möbius strip, the one seamlessly passing into the other. And one way of describing historic shift would be that the universalized avarice that Marx talked about turned into its flip side, the universalized mercy. What Lazzarato describes as the entrepreneur of the self, or more generally the new universal forms of subjectivity marked by precarity and debt, is the figure who, can, who has to count on the mercy of the other and is constantly at the mercy of the other someone who has to justify his existence in the eyes of the other, but never quite can. He's rather treated as a waste, always undeserving of the mercy of being alive, and who should be grateful for having the means of subsistence at all. Guilty and indebted, constantly indebted for his very existence. The waste management, including people, coincides with the mercy management. His inverted double is the figure of the financier, who automatically deserves mercy, who can count on mercy, regardless of the disastrous entrepreneurship and gigantic losses, never subjectivizing the debt. And the biggest debts are invariably incurred by the most powerful countries and the biggest banks, not by the indebted man at Lazzarato, which is the Lazzarato's prototype uh, of new subjectivity. Uh, I could see this constellation of deserving mercy um, at the, the 
uh, at the iconic moment, uh, the bailout in uh, the great crisis in 2008, the banks were simply entitled to the bailout, not as, a, as an act of mercy by state, for which they should be grateful, but not by any sense of responsibility, but by being in the mercy, by their very position which entitled them to speculation. So they counted with mercy, uh, with the miracle, and only miracle could make good their reckless um, entrepreneurship. And having failed, it turned out that they don't really need mercy because had they have been entitled to it all along. So this is the entitlement to mercy, which then acquires the structure of a blackmail. But if you count on mercy and assume that you deserve mercy, you actually no longer need mercy and you put everyone else at the mercy. And the quality of mercy is not strained. It is what most effectively strains. Thank you. We're going to go around with the mics for any questions. Thank you, Mladen. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, one is that capitalism seems to produce and require uh, a balance between desire and restraint. Uh, a, a balance between desire and restraint because the surplus has to be partly reinvested and partly consumed. So I don't see, uh, I see avarice um, uh, in the pure form of capitalism as a kind of aberration rather than uh, the norm uh, as you seem to have been arguing. Um, so for example, there's a Dutch historian, I can't remember his name exactly, uh, Jan something or the other, who, uh, who, who talked about um, industrious revolutions occurring uh, before capitalism uh, in pre-capitalist times. And that was clearly uh, a kind of balance of uh, restraint and uh, desire. Uh, and, and, uh, and then that grew into some amount of uh, miserliness and avarice which are sort of um, uh, aberrations or maybe representative of a certain phase of capitalism uh, and, and, and then austerity and so on. So uh, that balance is, is a dynamic thing and evolves with the structures of capitalism as it progresses through history. Um, so I would, I would submit that you know, uh, you focused uh, it seems on certain extreme images and I don't see them as representative of capitalism per se. So that's one question. Um, the second one is, uh, I don't see uh, why mercy uh, induces an infinite debt. Uh, you know, it, as you said, it's not based on a contract. And um, a person can refuse uh, to be in debt as easily as continue to be in debt. It's just a kind of moral uh, restraint um, and that's up to the individual. Um, and the third question is that you mentioned um, Hayek, but practically every, uh, many, even some Marxist economists, but practically every economist today would, would analyze um, uh, this kind of desire as the fulfillment of a series of needs rather than a kind of uh, unsatisfiable need. Uh, that mm -hmm. means there is one desire that is satisfied, then there is another desire that is satisfied, and so on, uh, rather than something that is going to remain unsatisfied. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's clear, but... Oh, it's clear. It's clear. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, first for the um, um, relationship with, between desire and restraint. Like you have a desire, and the desire is supposedly the desire for, to consume those goods, but you have to restrain yourself and reinvest in order to, for there to be progress and uh, further accumulation, etc., etc. You have to restrain. Where does the restraint come from? What is the, what is the instant of this restraint? The, what I was arguing for is that Restraint comes from the very logic of the desire. That actually capitalism uses a certain um, paradox of desire, which uh, 
from the very logic of desire, it follows an, that there is an instance which is actually more powerful in desire itself than the will to, cons that, let's say, the, the desire in this uh, commonsensical uh, understanding, the will for, to have goods and consume them. Huh? The very structure of desire actually implies this. This is why both Marx and Lacan and Freud actually thought that avarice is somehow in, uh, at the bottom of, can explain the very way that this, the, the desire actually ultimately functions. Huh? So you use this word, did you use the word industrious? Industrious. Yes. No, not, not industrial, but industrious. Well, I don't know. I think this is a typical myth that capitalism tries to install. That there, there was the, this industrious people who somehow by their um, self-discipline somehow brought um, that the, the, the capitalism is the result of industriousness as it were, which I think is a myth. The, I mean, the, if you look at the actual history of how uh, this primitive accumulation happened, it was far from that. It was, it's, it's a history of, uh, of, of colonization, plundering, uh, slavery, um, so, so, many, so many things were inscribed in uh, the actual becoming of capitalism that mere industriousness as the source of capitalism is a sort of retroactive, retroactive myth, I think. Um, I don't know if it's sufficiently answered to this question of re desire and restraint. I really try to insist on this very much as a sort of the internal paradox of desire rather than the social restraint which imposes certain things. You know? that this is the fatal connection in capitalism. The internal paradox of desire, a certain structure of desire, can coincide with this uh, actual accumulation of, um, of capital. Um, um, mercy and debt. You, you didn't see the connection between mercy and debt. I think mercy is what in debts the most. You know? Somebody shows you mercy and you are infinitely in, indebted to that instance. You know? Someone who mercifully um, and you have the positive side of this, which is somebody who shows you a very generous act, you, you are put someone in power in the, in the traditional societies, um, shows mercy to his subjects, um, they are endlessly in, indebted by love and submission. And you have the nasty version of this, which is whatever we are given now in this uh, situation of uh, late capitalism, precarity, debt society, etc., is actually an act of mercy. We are at the mercy of the other. We are at the mercy of the other. And we are constantly ever more at the mercy of the other. Hmm? Um, look at the way it has been incredibly exponentially um, produced and reproduced and expanded in the last 30 years. It's incredible. There's an infinitization of the same, of the same process. There's an infinitization of the same process. Um, there's no way that this debt economy, and I'm just bringing Lazzarato, who is, I suppose, the, be the, the best uh, theoretician of this, how, how have we become this debt society? Um, um, and the, the way that he gives the diagnosis, uh, the anatomy of what happened in the last 30 years seems very persuasive to me, that there's an infinitization of the, um, of the debt that we are all sort of uh, hostages to. And um, as to Hayek, okay, this goes back to... Um, uh, do we satisfy our needs or do we pursue is ever is a sort of exceptional? You know that on the first page of the capital Marx defines commodity as something that satisfies needs. And the nature of these needs, he goes on to say, uh, whether they stem from the stomach or the fantasy, is irrelevant. Um, and actually on the first page they, this, you already, they already sneaks in this, this strange thing. 
There is no stomach without fantasy. There is no stomach without desire, without another logic, which would uh, inhabit the needs. There is no such thing as a simple need that the commodity could uh, could satisfy. Okay, briefly. Um, I was thinking how this Mobius strip actually um, is absolutely epitomized in. Um, I think his name is John Mackey's. Uh, CEO of Whole Foods concept of conscious capitalism. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole management strategy that um, the CEO of Whole Foods came up with in which um, capitalists come together with NGOs and um, various organizations um, that can increase profit through the use of mercy more or less or charity. And what the goal is, and what, like, say here in India, is to take, um, say, a surplus population of people who are, let's say, with being trafficked, and then to sort of recycle them back into the economy um, by saving them and employing them in, say, detention centers and so on and so forth in order to um, get new work or to increase, and the way it's framed is to increase GDP and at the same time save and have um, a group of, you know, indebted workers. So it's a kind of interesting. <clears throat> but one of the reasons that it's so, so successful is because of a structural or secular decline of capitalism and improbability um, in which you can, and especially with the decline of the the state under neoliberalism um, incorporate all of these charities and so on to do sort of the work of the state. Um, since you cannot increase taxes and you already have to do, uh, increase your labor supply costs, whatever. Okay. So <laughs> I was just wondering how this, like in terms of neoliberalism and periodization um, with respect to the declining rate of profit and crisis, how this um, kind of works together. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, no, no, absolutely with you. Absolutely with you. I, I, actually, there's, there is a section I wanted to add at the end, precisely dealing with the question of charity and its economy in our times, increasing economy of, of charity and the perverse nature of it, um, the completely perverse nature of it. It's really a sort of maybe a strip, as you said, uh, the, the whole charity economy which is supposed to counteract the whatever poverty, natural disasters or whatever is actually a very good sort of uh, uh, mercy management, mercy management. And, um, um, you know, we have this, okay, uh, Slava quotes from time to time, this Oscar Wilde from The Soul of Man in Socialism, he says, it's, it's extremely shameful to um, counteract by private, I'm, I'm not, I don't know exactly, to counteract by private property the evils caused by private property. Um, it's just one very simple sentence, you know, you, you make of your private property to help all these uh, uh, impoverished masses in the third world or whatever, but this is the, I should always bear in mind that this is an evil which was brought about by private property, you know, so there's no way you can, you can solve this problem in that way, you know but charitably sort of, and of course you like yourself as this very charitable person who cares about the third world development, fair trade, etc., etc. I mean, there's always this self-congratulatory aspect to, to charity, no? I'm not uh, calculating uh, tough, avaricious, uh, avaricious capitalist. I give freely something um, to solve uh, world's problems, but this is exactly what keeps the world's problems in place. I mean, so, yes. You know that charity was the standard Christian virtue precisely to counteract avarice. This is how I started the whole thing. No? And uh, the, this, um, uh, the story that Max Weber is telling is an absolutely extraordinary story. It's an incredible story. No? And regardless of so many, so much criticism that has been done on this, his basic idea still stands, you know? the basic paradox of capitalism. How do you, how the hell can you account for capitalism arising from a certain 
Protestant setup, which is entirely based on predestination, uh, entirely based on the question of uh, it's already decided whether you work well or you don't work, you spend your life in sin or virtue, it's already decided arbitrarily in advance. So why the hell would that trigger the investment, the, the laboriousness, the, tra the industriousness of this uh, early, early capitalism? Huh? And charity is part of this story. Charity is part of this story because uh, this was the Protestant criticism of the uh, a certain a Catholic trade in charity. Huh? And uh, the, the very... Um, the very reason why Luther in the first place stood up was this, you know, that Catholicism started to trade in, you know, charity was a marketable, marketable good. So this is why they had this, this ban, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, it's only, it's only then, well, okay, I suppose it was always present in some way, but it's only at a later stage that this sort of charity, mercy, actually they took over, I think, as a general framework within which we, could, we should think the contemporary society. I cannot but agree. <laughs> okay, and this, uh, of course, this, this structure of uh, the restraint being the internal to desire itself, I think it's, it's a wider structure. It's a, wide, it's a wider structure. I think it's, it's, in a way, what defines human desire. And, um, I mean, the fatal thing was that this avarice, which, I mean, for Lacan, actually, is the desire brought to the minimum to the gist. No? To, to the minimum and to the gist somehow, that this could form, uh, let's say, the, well, the libidinal structure, the, the, economy, the, the economy of desire, the structure of desire to subtend um, the, the very advent of capitalism, where this kind of structure could actually s start serving as a social tie. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, I agree that uh, mercy as an instrument of control exists very much in capitalism. But I, what I wanted to know was, what are your thoughts about the idea of self-actualization? Oh. Self-actualization in the context of capitalism, a capitalist, uh, you know, um, endeavor or industriness 
does it have any possibility in terms of self actualization vis-a-vis uh, -vis Maslow in, a, in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs does a capitalist ever aspire to self actualization if, and if it does then what kind of impact it has on society and second thing I wanted to uh, just uh, know your thoughts on um, the, uh, the dividing line between compassion and mercy again in the context of you yeah. know Okay, Maslow and self-actualization. Huh. Um, it's a tough one. I, I, I don't see it in that way at all. That, uh, you, you think that the capitalism is an attempt at self-actualization in Maslow's sense? Uh, just want to know your thoughts. Whether it's uh -huh. is there a possibility there? Can it possibly be a self-actualization in Maslow's sense of self-actualization? Oh, I, um, I think in any analysis of capitalism, this is not where one can start. I mean, one can, I, I think one should start, well, Marx starts with a certain logic of commodity money, capital, etc., deducing a certain, um, I mean, it, uh, it's a deduction, a logical deduction of those, of those terms and what they imply. And what I try to somehow show is that the very, this very deduction, commodity, money, capital, already involves a certain structure of desire. It doesn't merely say how does economy work, it actually implies a certain um, um, structure of subjectivity and its desire which is at work there. And I think this Marxist analysis that, there is a, that avarice is not a personal trait. It's not a psychological trait. It's a structural trait. I mean, he speaks about the structure of desire implied in this, which can show itself in all kinds of ways, but it nevertheless, independently of whether one can find self-actualization within this society in this way or another, it is structurally bound to the, to the des avaricious desire as a structural determinant. Eh? This is Marx's point. He doesn't speak about um, um, particular personal development and its satisfaction or dissatisfaction that a person can have within the society, which is Maslow's aim. You know, you have a certain hierarchy of ends and actualizations, and one should strive for this. And I don't think he ever actually asks within which social framework this happens. What is the very external condition within which you are inscribed to speak about this? I mean, there's no reason he should. I mean, he deals with a completely different problem. I just think that the problem should be framed, framed in this way. I mean, what is the, yeah, the structural determinants? And uh, the question of um, mercy and compassion. Um, you know, you have in, um, in Islam, you have this, this formula, Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. Anything, anything in Islamic countries uh, somehow happens under this uh, general banner. Even if you take a, a plane, a flight, the thing that uh, the pilot will tell you in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. We are flying now to whatever. Um, so you have, so there you have this uh, assumption that the compassion and mercy are somehow equivalent. In in uh, the Christian culture, they are not quite equivalent. I mean, the, you have uh, compassion is um, is uh, um, identification with the pain of the other. Let me say, so you feel the, I can feel your pain as as. Um, President Clinton used, used to say, you know, uh, when he came to Africa, I can feel your pain. And you can see that didn't, this didn't amount to much. I mean, he, could feel, he could feel a lot of African pain, but uh, 
you can see what, what the situation is like 20 years later. So compassion is about a, a certain ability to empathize with the other. And it's a, it's a laudable ability. But it doesn't, in its consequences, it doesn't amount to much. I mean, it has to be, so the, the third term, apart from compassion and mercy, the third term that should be introduced is the question of justice, eh? which has nothing to do with whether we empathize with the other or not, or whether, whether we are willing to mercifully bestow our charity on the others or not. It's the question of justice. And this is well, one simple word on which one should insist in this. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, really uh, compelling, and I'd love to have an opportunity to read the text to really get into the subtleties. But I have a very short kind of question or prompt, really, which is that isn't the truly mysterious figure here not the figure of you know the infinite drive uh, or the infinite contentless drive, but precisely the uh, the economic actor, the standard economic actor who is satisfied with what he gets, right? The idea of the economy in which people actually have pure and plain relations of desire and satisfaction and they transact according to those. I mean, isn't that the truly mysterious figure that anything like that could ever be sustained as a kind of commonsensical notion of how the world works? I completely agree with you. I don't think, I think the homo economicus is the, is the myth of the of the political economy. Huh? But the question is, how does it have any traction? How does it have any traction? Hmm. How can it be, yes. It, yes, no, I, I, I see what you mean, that um, it's somehow easy to posit as a, as a mythical agent and actor of uh, the whole economic enterprise. But how the hell can anybody believe that this is the case? <laughs> no, it's a, no, it's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, hmm. No, um, it's, it, it's a good question, but it poses, I mean, it, sh it could be answered in a, in, a wider, in a wider framework. I mean, how, how does any ideology actually work? which, I mean, this is, this is a very basic ideological trick, to present some sort of uh, mythical personality, no? a mythical ideal um, agent, as it were, which any analysis can show that it never worked that way. No? But um, one somehow, nevertheless, assumes, buys, this story as in a way making immediate sense of certain of certain realities an easy way of making sense of, of certain realities and um, I mean it's it's a far larger question that you are actually asking like um, the question of uh, how, how could not only how can homo economics ever, ever get an interaction how can uh, market economy ever get an interaction free market. It is a thing which has never worked historically. It doesn't work today and it never had any historic realization. You can see that any free market is always framed by uh, um, certain conditions which uh, slant it very much in one way or another and there are completely different forces at play than the, f the famous free market forces, which, which should uh, form, which, which should be the only stuff which forms the social social tie. So it's a much wider question. Like, why does uh, why do such things, which are completely ideological notions, which actually any analysis very quickly shows that they can be destroyed, why do they hold us in check? But yes. But it seems to me that some ideological figures, at least one can kind of explain the plausibility of how they would seize on to certain underlying drives and provide those with a kind of ideological cover. So, for instance, the figure of the free market contains a kind of figure of infinite drive which translates, perhaps in a misrecognized form, something. So one can explain that. What seems to me so puzzling about the figure of sort of the moral economy, if you like, 
you know, the stable moral economy, is that it actually reflects nothing that I can recognize in social life uh, as even a sort of, as it were, potentiality. But doesn't, doesn't it go hand in hand somehow with the ideology of the free market and the free market forces? Yeah. Yeah. I think this can only be explained in, far, in, a, in a larger, in a sort of larger, why do some key claims of the ideology that we buy are simply, I mean, in this naive way, not sustainable by, you know, if you confront them to some harsh view of reality that they are supposed to cover. If I may continue uh, the conversation you just had with the gentleman at the other end, uh, I, I don't see, um, and this is partly in response to your response to my first question, I don't see why um, real needs are not satisfied in capitalism. Um, after all, uh, you know, the economy has to reproduce itself and that couldn't happen without real needs being satisfied. It just couldn't, um, you know. So uh, I don't see it, um, I mean it's nice to see these things as figures but real people are filling their bellies or not um, in real time in outside. You know, it's, it, you know, here we are talking about uh, figures and um, ideology and so on, but that's, that's fine. And it is an ideological construction, the free market. It's an abstraction from the real economy and uh, it's a false abstraction. Uh, but, but the point is that um, real needs do get satisfied, otherwise Capitalism couldn't reproduce itself. Yes, um, let's say that uh, real needs do get satisfied. Yes, but can one can one explain capitalism by the will to satisfy real needs? I don't think. Say one. that again. I, it, there's um, there, there, there are two things. You, you can say real needs do get satisfied. I mean, yeah. the, but again, I'm very uncomfortable with this uh, notion of real needs. No? Needs are being uh, produced in capitalism. Yes. This is Marxist. Yeah. This is Marxist. Uh, yeah. It's not yeah. that we have needs and then they get satisfied. I mean, every commodity also produces new needs. It's about the production of needs. Mm -hmm. no? mm -hmm. It's not just the production of commodities to satisfy needs. Sure. But I would just say, even if I admit, okay, real needs get satisfied, whatever one means by real needs, the capitalism cannot be explained as a system which aims at satisfaction of real needs. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not making that claim though. Okay. So, okay. you know, uh, and just a side point about industrious revolutions. Uh, how would accumulation occur in primitive times um, uh, if there were no industry in the sense of saving and reinvestment by this Dutch historian that these small family farms exercised this kind of industry and it emerged not only in Europe but also in places like China, Southeast Asia and so on. Um, so there were, it was a sort of a global phenomenon uh, where on uh, individual farms people uh, exercise both desire and restraint in that sense and um, uh, accumulated, saved, reinvested, and, and, and grew. Uh. Yes, well, I would just say that uh, Shakespeare's uh, Merchant of Venice, you know, <clears throat> why does the problem arise in Merchant of Venice? Because Antonio doesn't have money, he has to borrow it from Shylock. Why doesn't he have money? Because all his investments, all his uh, numerous uh, ships and vessels are spread around the world. I mean, it's a time of globalization. Huh? And he is running a high-risk business. Globalization, colonization, his ships are in Mexico, in the Indies, and, well, you can see the framework of this wealth of the Venetian society stemming from colonization at that time. And then you have the, the, the Shylock's speech about slaves, saying well, you have so many slaves in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Venice, so many pounds of flesh. Why do you deny me one by pound of flesh I'm, I'm uh, entitled to? Huh? So you can see Shakespeare's own description of Venice, the most prosperous capitalist city at the end of 60th century, 
is something completely based on colonization, globalization, and slavery. Yeah? So that, there, that was a major, a very major factor in the primitive accumulation of the, of the capital. And yes, this went hand in hand with a certain restructuring of manufacturers and uh, the reinvestment and a certain diff different kind of uh, economic logic than, that brought about modernity, the Protestant. I mean, the multiple stories which coincided when, in the advent of capitalism. It's not, there's no one simple story that one can, one can tell how it came about. But there is, I mean, you know that Marx starts with the inherent premises of what is a capitalist society, and only in the seventh chapter he comes to the question of the so-called primitive, uh, primitive accumulation. And the so-called primitive accumulation is a heterogeneous multiple story. Huh? It, it's not reducible to one, one thing, and particularly not reducible to this in myth, uh, myth of the industrious people who saved and disciplined themselves and reinvested and were therefore created capitalism. Hello? Um, Hi. Uh, this is just an observation, not a question as such. Um, here. Ah. Yeah. So, um, especially in India, last one month we are going through this whole concept of demonetization and on social media, more of us are actually putting this all these con concepts which are anti-demonetization but in reality we hardly see any protest building up or there is no organized protest and somewhere I was just after listening to your thought, uh, lecture I was thinking that is it that we are so slave to capitalism and our desires that we are not able to protest in real sense and just standing in queues and getting whatever cash we are getting and all the time acquiring this discourse of charity and mercy and saying that I am getting cash for my maid, you know, because she doesn't have a bank account and I have to give her cash. So it's not for me, but it's for maid. But I'm sure many of us are putting money in their bank accounts or where, whichever way we can give them. But we are definitely getting into this whole mode of rationalizing our desires and saying that and using this discourse of charity. And is it that because of this we are not able to, um, more and more these pro places of, spaces of protest are getting shrinked? So this is the, the general question which I thought and but I will just put it. <laughs> no, I, I thank you for this comment and I, I can see I can see the problem. I, mean, could, I could see the problem the moment I landed in India uh, <laughs> a day ago and there was a sudden problem with cash. You, know, you, you cannot um, get anything else but 2,000 rupees in, uh, on the machines and you cannot buy anything with it because nobody has the change. And uh, I can see that uh, this demonetization actually did produce a very major problem. And uh, as far as I can see, it is, there is a very pernicious logic behind the whole, behind the whole move. And, but why, why, does the, why do the masses not protest? It's, it's a very old question. You know that it goes back to... Uh, La Boesie and uh, 1550, the, the discourse on the, on the um, voluntary servitude. Why there are so few and we are so many? We, we could, you know, we have all the power. Why do we not protest? Why do we let us be imposed on in this way? Okay. The self-actualization, I'm not following. Uh, in case of desire. In case of desire. Is there a self-actualization of desire at all? Or <laughs> in capitalism? Or <laughs> ah. um. You know you have in Lacan this adage of... Um, do, do not give up on your desire. Do not give way as to your desire. No? Ne pas se déçu sans désir. Now, this is one of the uh, ethical adages of, of uh, psychoanalysis. Like, um, God knows if there is a satisfaction, a self-actualization of desire ever. But it's something one, one, one should do, which is not to give up as to one's desire. 